So this young girl was never proper assessed. Probably a week later or so, she succeeded. Tonight, a First Nation in northern Manitoba is on the brink. We do get our traditional foods in our powwows, but otherwise than that, you know, we, we, the hunters have to go far. A decade-long study finds traditional foods are hard to come by. Oh yeah, there's scouts calling me, they want it sunny, junior array, even across Canada. And an Eskasoni hockey team is getting attention. Good evening, I'm Dennis Ward. Welcome to APTN National News. Another fatal fire to tell you about tonight. This one, a trailer fire on a First Nation in southwestern Ontario that has taken the life of a young child. It involves a, uh, a family that was living here and uh, unfortunately a young girl has, uh, has died. Flames broke out on the Mississaugas of the Credit First Nation around uh, early morning on uh, Monday. Ontario Provincial Police say the trailer was engulfed in flames when firefighters arrived. Two adults and four children were able to escape with minor injuries. I just uh, wanted to put out my sincere and deepest condolences to everyone that has been affected by this tragedy, to family members, to friends, to the victims involved in this incident, and to the community for your loss. You are in our thoughts and prayers as, uh, as we deal with this tragedy. The Mississaugas of the new Credit First Nation is south of Brantford of, in Ontario. Band Chief Stacey Laform told CTV News that her community is deeply saddened by the loss of the child. A sacred fire has been lit near the band office. The remote northeastern Manitoba community of Shumatawa, 745 kilometers northeast of Winnipeg, has issued a state of emergency as it reels from a series of devastating events. APTN's Leanne Sanders reports. They need a future. All they have is what, is what they can see. They can't see beyond the trees. Chief Jordan Hill of Shamatawa First Nation says young people in his community have no hope after a number of recent tragedies. He declared a state of emergency citing the recent suicide of a young girl after her mother had called RCMP for help and RCMP failed to take her to the nursing station. So this young girl was never proper assessed. Probably a week later or so. She succeeded. And the mother was crying for help. And now, just past Wednesday, the mother uh, committed suicide also. Hill is afraid this is just the beginning if nothing is done. His community is reeling from a fire at a nine-unit apartment building that housed the elderly. Their fire truck was not working at the time. And that fire worsened an already overcrowded housing problem as those displaced have to live with family. Assembly of Manitoba Chiefs Kathy Merrick said the governments are failing First Nations. We are beggars in our own country. And it breaks my heart mm -hmm. sitting here today. Merrick called out both levels of government for failing to provide mm -hmm. essential services while nations struggle with drug addiction, mental health problems, housing, and other social issues. She said First Nations are not asking for any more than any other Manitoban or Canadian. Assembly of First Nations Regional Chief Cindy Woodhouse says ending the crisis is going to take cooperation between the feds and province of Manitoba and the First Nations. Just a few weeks ago, you know, the Prime Minister had met with, you know, all these provinces, including the province of Manitoba, talking about uh, our health needs and our needs. And there's these big figures out there, and yet they don't even uh, want to talk to First Nations. This is the second time Shamatawa has had to declare a state of emergency. Leanne Sanders, APTN National News, Winnipeg. In a statement emailed to APTN, the RCMP offered its condolences to the community 
and said it recognizes the profound effect the tragedy has had and confirmed officers did respond to a call on January 17th. Officers spoke with the youth and her mother and offered assistance in transporting them both to the nursing station for follow-up. On January 18th, an RCMP officer met with a local medical professional and gathered additional information on resources the family could access. The officer was also advised that additional resources were being sought for the youth. If you're experiencing emotional distress and want to talk, you can call the Hope for Wellness helpline at 1-855-242-3310. Well, it's a far cry from the days when nutritionists experimented on children in residential schools. A decade-long nutritional study on First Nations kids was unveiled in Ganasatage Mohawk territory on the weekend. Academics and nurses are traveling across Canada to work with First Nations to improve the health of their children. Amelia Fournier has more. Traditional food is very, very important to all First Nation communities that we look at. Ganasatage celebrated the conclusion of the Food, Environment, Health and Nutrition of First Nations Children and Youth Study, or FENCI. The pandemic extended the process by years and prevented many children from participating, so results on the overall health of youth were not conclusive. But the study helped guide recommendations for improvements in indoor air quality and nutrition and found that traditional foods are nutritious but hard to come by. Well, we do get our traditional foods in our powwows, but otherwise than that, you know, we, we, the hunters have to go far, so it's expensive when you got to bring that meat back and uh, process it. Tess Lalonde is Dakota Sioux, but has lived in Ganasatage since the 90s. So it's a big Nyawa Goa to the community. As the community engagement liaison, she interviewed community members and leadership to find out what their goals were. We're trying to bring the traditional foods back in the community. We're trying to bring the bugs back instead of the insecticides. We're trying to make this more uh, natural. So that was very nice to see that the community is working towards a healthier environment. Lead investigators Malek Batal of the University of Montreal and Laurie Chan of the University of Ottawa analyzed the data from youth like hair and blood samples and their height and weight. We do everything in a participatory way, so we hope that we are answering in every community to the needs of the community, not to the needs of the research. Your nation is considered the owner of all data collected from your community. Unlike in the past, First Nations own and control this data. Jeremy Tomlinson of the Ganasatage Health Centre says the study has already led to change. We're working now with uh, two nutritionists, we're working with a school, we're able to get funds in order to take, uh, take on this initiative, uh, so we're going to introduce uh, more healthy, uh, healthy foods for the children in our schools here in Ganasatage. The researchers and Lalonde will be heading to Miaupagek First Nation in Newfoundland next but they'll still be working with Ghana Satage to develop programs and policies in the future. Basically, it's, it's a partnership, and it's, it's a partnership that starts and continues throughout the study and beyond. Emilia Fournier, APTN National News, Ghana Satage. Time for a quick break. Still to come, reaction to the release of uh, the names of priests accused of sexually abusing children. Stick around. Welcome back. The Jesuits of Canada have released a list of 27 priests who were accused of sexually abusing children over the past 70 years. The Catholic Order called the allegations, quote, credible. At least 10 of the 27 priests were in First Nations uh, throughout Northern Ontario. All of them have since died. Six of the accused were at the Spanish Indian Residential School west of Sudbury, the only institution operated by the Jesuits in Canada. A spokesperson for the order says most of the victims of three abusers were teenagers from First Nations in Ontario. One of them, the late father George Epoch, uh, received over 100 and 20 allegations from three First Nations. And joining me now to talk about the list is Jesse Boydo, Senior Archivist at the National Centre for Truth and Reconciliation. 
Jesse, thanks for taking some time for us. So what do you make of this move by the Jesuits to release the names of priests that have been accused of sexual abuse? Yeah, so when, when the news broke yesterday about this list, my first thought was with the survivors and their family members and those who have been directly affected by, um, by the individuals who were on this list. Um, these, these survivors and their communities are gonna, need, are gonna need our support during these coming days and weeks. Indeed. Um, you know, do you think that other religious orders should follow suit the same way? Yeah, like really, I think an important next step for for other groups that are sort of, you know, debating whether or not to do this type of exercise is really to um, start engaging with those survivors and those communities that were most affected by these individuals. Uh, you know, it's not it's not really for me to say, um, knowing that that um, you know this type of topic could could be fairly divisive. Indeed, uh, many of the priests here listed uh, have already passed on. Is it too little, too late to be announcing these names? I don't think so. Um, really, it's 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 going to help validate those survivors who have provided their testimony. Uh, to the TRC or provided their testimony to others in in public or private settings where they've you know they've told their story and how this helps to to validate their truth. Do you have uh, any thoughts on what should happen now with the list? Uh, again, I I just always like to bring it back to survivors. Um, so I think the next step is is really. Um, to offer support here, because uh, oftentimes when news like this breaks, like with the chem loops, um, you know, it can open up a lot of pre-existing wounds. So uh, I think first and foremost, we need to be there for survivors. And then following that, we can, we can work with them and engage with them to sort of, you know, learn from their perspectives what the next steps should be. All right. Well, Jesse, we'll leave it there, but I uh, appreciate you taking some time for us to talk about this. It's my pleasure. Thank you. And the National Indian Residential School Crisis Line is available for survivors and others who might need support. That number is 1-866-925-4419. Time to step aside for one more break. Still to come, community spirit hits the ice on Eskasoni First Nation. We just got to keep, keep, keep working hard and uh, you know, we'll, we'll do fine. Welcome back. Time now for a look at our photo of the day. And our very own Charlotte Mort Jacobs sent this great shot of a clear sky with a full moon taken just outside Yellowknife in Treaty 8. Thanks so much, Charlotte, for sending that in. You can send your photos to share at aptn.ca if you'd like to be our next photo of the day. Now let's take a look at tomorrow's weather forecast. Starting on the East Coast, plus six in Halifax, minus one with snow in St. John's. Ten below in Kujuwak, snow and eight below in Nain. Plus four in Montreal, two above in Val d'Or. Four in Sault Ste. Marie, plus one for North Bay. Plus four in Cloudy and Thunder Bay, plus one with snow for Sioux Lookout. Minus 18 in Churchill, two below with snow in God's Lake. Minus three in Winnipeg and Dauphin. Minus six with snow in Regina, cloudy and eight below in Saskatoon. Minus five in Meadow Lake, seven below with snow in La Ronge. In Northern Alberta, minus nine with snow in high level, five below and flurries in Fort McMurray. Minus five in Edmonton, snow and plus six in Lethbridge. 9 above in Vancouver, plus 11 in Victoria. 3 above with snow in Prince George, minus 2 with flurries in Deese Lake. Minus 23 for Old Crow, 6 below and snow in Whitehorse. Minus 15 with snow in Yellowknife, 20 below in Norman Wells. 
minus 31 for Saks Harbor, 26 below with snow in Politak. Minus 25 in Chesterfield, Whale Cove, and Cambridge Bay. Minus 29 with snow in Resolute, 21 below, and snow in the Glue Lake. To the ice now, and the Eskasoni Junior Eagles are having a historic year. They are currently in the midst of a best of seven playoff series in Nova Scotia's Junior Hockey League. But the team's success goes far beyond the rink. It's also about building community spirit in the Eskasoni First Nation. And as Angel Moore reports, breaking down racism with a measure of Mi'kmaq culture at every home game. Fifteen-year-old Suri Paul opens things up with an honor song. And then, just before the game, a hockey tradition familiar to everybody. O Canada, but sung in Mi'kmaq. And then, intense playoff hockey. The Escazoni Junior Eagles are battling the Pictou County Scotians. The winner of the series goes on to the division final. Eagles team captain, Sonny Kabaddi, is confident of victory. They're, they're a grinding team. Um, they're, they're, they're hardworking, so, you know, they're, they're obviously not a team that's, you know, not counted out right now because, you know, they have a lot of firepower there, so, you know, we just got to keep, keep, keep working hard and, uh, you know, we'll, we'll do fine. Kabaddi led the league in scoring with 42 goals and 50 assists four points short of the league record of 96. In addition to Kabaddi, four junior Eagles sat atop the league's scoring leaders at the end of the season. They include Dante Basque, Marcellus Francis, and Jacob Denny. All of them are Mi'kmaq. In fact, coach Matthew Gould says hockey scouts are checking out the players. Oh yeah, there's scouts calling me. They wanted Sunny Junior Ray even across Canada, but uh, we love him here and we, we want to keep him. <laughs> Caleb Gould is a super fan and attends every game. Yeah, that's that's it. Since day one. Number one. Yeah, number one. Number one, number one bro. Woo! 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 Mi'kmaq flags are proudly displayed in the Dan K. Stevens Memorial Arena at the Escazoni First Nation. The Eagles are the first Indigenous-owned and operated team in the Nova Scotia Junior Hockey League. They have Indigenous and non-Indigenous players and were formed about five years ago by Eskazoni community members. We, f we figured as our own community in a, with isolated community, like we're in the middle of Cape Breton and giving our boys an option to, to play in this league. It was a time when racism in hockey was making headlines. Now, Mi'kmaq players can play hockey in their own community, says Escazoni Chief Leroy Denny. Racism will always be there, you know, and just a matter of educating. And, uh, and um, I give credit to the Lee for allowing us to uh, express our culture, our songs, as you see in, in our games and our language and commentating in, in our language. Denny is an owner, president, and play-by-play -play announcer. His commentary is in Mi'kmaq, and the game is live-streamed on social media. Uh, able to showcase and, uh, and educate people of who we are as a Mi'kmaq people, as indigenous people in this country. It's a chance to hang out with friends and celebrate a goal. The arena is packed with about 800 fans, including Leon Francis a goalie for the Cape Breton Blizzard hockey team. Because it's fun, energetic, and there's fun things you can do is celebrate. The sport brings the community together, including the very young. Enjoy the game. Fan Thomas Denny says, I feel great about this game. The Eagles got it, you know. We got a lot of firepower on the team, and we're coming to prove everyone wrong. On the other side of the arena is another fan, the Premier of Nova Scotia, Tim Houston. His son plays for the Pictou County Scotians. 
Houston says the Eagles' home games are a lot of fun. Look how successful they are now from just from working at it, developing kids. Some of the top players in this league are from this community playing on this team. So it's great to see, and, and I love coming here. Leroy rubs me a little, rubs me a little bit sometimes, but we're, we're great friends, and I'm really, really proud of uh, this association and what they're doing here. 200 T-shirts were donated to give thanks to the fans. They soon become souvenirs. Gould appreciates the support. We had a pack house tonight, and we, we appreciate all the fans coming out and supporting us and cheering the boys on throughout the season. 17-year-old Marcellus Francis is in his first year and already knows a hockey cliche when being interviewed. It's a team effort. Feels good. I, I obviously couldn't do it without these guys. They helped me a lot. It's fun playing with them. Yeah. The Junior Eagles won 7-3 and are on their way to the division finals to face the Antigonish A.A. Monroe Junior B Bulldogs. Angel Moore, APTN, National News, Escazoni, First Nation. Tonight on Face to Face, we get out of the studio and hit the ice with Métis curler Carrie Anderson. She's fresh off her record-tying fourth straight Canadian Women's National Curling Championship. Carrie and Team Anderson will be going for gold starting this Friday at the Women's World Curling Championship in Sweden. I started curling at the age of eight. Um, I, my uncle Greg McCauley, he won the Worlds uh, back in 2000 and the Briar. Um, and when he won, I knew that was something that I wanted to do. So uh, I've been uh, chasing my dreams ever since I was uh, started juniors. So. Uh, yeah, it's been an amazing journey, and uh, yeah, it's. I never thought I would get to where I am today, and uh, but we've put in a lot of hard work um, on and off the ice, and uh, it's definitely paying off. Carrie and I also curl two ends in this episode. I won't spoil the outcome for you, as you can watch for yourself in roughly two minutes' time, but it may surprise you. And be sure to tune in tomorrow at 3 p.m. Eastern Time for In Focus. Daryl will be coming to you from the 2023 International Indigenous Tourism Conference in Winnipeg. That's all the time we have for today's show. You can find much more over on our website. That's aptnnews.ca. I'm Dennis Ward. Thanks for being with us. Have a great night.